send your tests and a lot of homework back to you next week. Well, in a way, I will. I'm not sure if I would curve it on the test, but I mean, at the end, you know, like the the total grades sort of get curved depending on how people do, you know. Yes. You might not have started any of the problems. Oh, the last problem. Yeah. You, you know, I might, it, it was longer than I meant it to be. Yeah, well, uh, you know, what I might do is if the scores are on the test or low overall because it was long and I, I could tell it was long. Uh, I mean, when you took it, I could tell it was long. Uh, is I, I'll score the test and then, uh, like, when I do the grades, I'll make it out of a lower maximum. You know what I mean? So instead of being, what's 9 times 6? 54. So instead of being out of, instead of being out of 54, it'll be out of 50 or something. And that sort of bumps the percentages up. So, but we'll see, you know. But uh, I definitely... It definitely was obvious that people who usually don't have trouble getting getting done on time were having more trouble than usual getting done on time. So uh, I'll do something about that. Okay, let's go. Let's do this. Um, Meredith, do you have anything to say to the class today? Okay. Okay. For the trees. You need that. So we are now, so we're on the next topic. Yes, uh, it's really, so let's think of it as two things, the work energy principle and conservation of, a lot of times you, people say conservation of energy because um, it's shorter, but it's really conservation of mechanical energy. It's sort of um, different than just the, the general idea that energy is conserved. Um, so the work energy principle Um, always holds as long as no energy um, is expressed uh, Uh, this is sort of a weird wording, but as as long as no energy is expressed uh, non-mechanically, mm, yeah. well, you know, <laughs> as, yes, that's a better, as long as all energy is expressed mechanically. Okay, so let me give some examples of So, for example, um, there's no thermal energy. Electromagnetic energy
there's all these ways that energy can be expressed. We're just talking about, um, so there's not going to be big changes in temperature. There's not going to be, um, there's not going to be a lot of electrical or magnetic stuff going on. Um, in certain cases, so you can think of the work energy principle as the more general rule. In certain cases, bless you, um, the work energy principle can be simplified to conservation of mechanical energy. Okay, so the requirements for using conservation of mechanical energy are more strict than for using the work energy principle. Um, so that right there says that conservation of mechanical energy is a very different thing than the totally general idea of conservation of energy. Um, so don't confuse uh, restrictive uh, conservation of mechanical energy uh, with the totally general, no restrictions at all, uh, conservation of energy overall. So really, uh, what we're doing here is we're saying, so conservation of energy, there's a million kinds of energy. There's uh, heat energy, light energy, sound energy, mechanical energy. Um, there's all these kinds of energy, and if you can, and overall, from one instant to another in the universe, all of that energy is conserved, but it, you can change that energy from one type to another type. If a million, almost a million of those types of energy are not a factor, they don't change over time, then you can make this very restrictive statement that mechanical energy is conserved. Yep. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, that Yeah, that's, that kind of stuff is not, uh, it's not my, you know, I'm not really a physicist, so that's not really something that I uh, know that well, but um, one thing that's, uh, let's, no, let's not go there. Okay. So, no, that's fine. Uh, all right, so. Here are the steps that we're going to question. Um, there'll be certain cases where, I mean, you know just from, like, things that happen on the tabletop or whatever where there's not changes in temperature are going are gonna to meet these requirements. But not everything meets these requirements. So, like, for example, you can't use conservation of mechanical energy to figure out what's happening in a heat engine or an explosion, things where there's huge thermal uh, changes. Okay, so here are the, here's the order of topics that we're going to do. Um, so first, we already talked about this. I'll mention it again, but first we have to do the mathematical preliminary of talking about the dot product. Did that. Uh, then we're going to use the dot product to talk about calculating work. 
and talk about what work is. Um, then we're going to talk about the work energy principle. This is the most general uh, energy equation for us. And then last, we're going to um, we're going to show how in specific cases the work energy principle transforms into conservation of mechanical energy. Yeah. Um. And I want to keep emphasizing that the work energy principle is the source of conservation of mechanical energy, and that this is just a, sort of a dumbed down version of the work energy principle that we'll be able to use under certain conditions. Okay. All right, so dot product. Um, so say that we have. Two vectors U and V. Um, you can think about the dot product a couple of ways. The first one is U dot V is equal to the X component of U times the X component of V plus the y component of u times the y component of v. And notice that during the dot product, we start out with two vectors, and we end up with a scalar. So we don't have a vector at the end. Uh, and actually, that since we're going to use the dot product to calculate work, which is a sort of a type of energy, a change in energy, that gives some insight into the fact that energy doesn't have direction. All of the main uh, quantities that we've talked about so far have been vector quantities. They've had direction. Energy is not that way. You don't have 40 joules of energy west. You just have 40 joules of energy or you've lost it, you know. <laughs> you have lost it. You're going to get it back, though. The other way to do this calculation is find the magnitudes of those vectors and multiply them together. And then multiply the product of those magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. They have to be tail to tail. And this tells us that if you take the dot product of two angles that are per of two vectors that are perpendicular to each other, the dot product has to be zero. Dot product of two perpendicular vectors is zero. And then there was a third one uh, that I mentioned last time that said, blah, blah, blah. Really, the important thing here is um, if U and V are 
less than 90 degrees apart within 90 degrees of each other and the dot product of u and v is positive No, this is all dot product. And if U and V are more than 90 degrees apart, U dot V is negative. So if U and V are perpendicular, you know, which they're not most of the time, but if they happen to be perpendicular, then U dot V would be zero. This is the dot product. It's just another way to think about it. Um, okay, so here's an example. So let's say that the vector u is 3, negative 4, and the vector v is 2, 0. Um, we want to calculate u dot v v dot u and then we want to figure out if they're within 90 degrees or you know greater than 90 degrees apart And then we'll just think about those physically and compare our answers with that. Oh, wait, have we talked about this part already? And this problem? No, like the more than 90 degrees. That's number three here. Uh, yeah, yeah, but have we talked about it? Yeah, we did. Yep. I'm just rehashing what we did last time. Okay, so for part A, what's u dot v? So the dot product of 3, negative 4 with 2, 0 is 3 times 2 plus negative 4 times 0. And that's six. Part B, we want to do just the other order of dot product. So two zero dotted with three negative four. Yep, it's got to be the same since this is just uh, defined by multiplication. And so uh, 2 times 3 plus 0 times negative 4 is equal to 6. So the order of that product doesn't matter. The other uh, most common way of multiplying two vectors is called the cross product. And in that one, the order does matter, but here it doesn't. Yeah. 
Yes. It's always a scaler, yep. And a lot of times uh, people talk about the dot product as the scalar product because of that, and the cross product is a vector product because the output is a vector. Um, okay, so now part C, are these uh, within 90 degrees or more than 90 degrees apart? Six, six is positive, so... Uh, U and V are less than 90 degrees. Okay, so let me uh, draw those two vectors out. Um, I'm going to put them tail to tail. The vector U, 3, negative 4. Looks something like that. Um, the vector v two zero looks something like that. And so, when you put them tail to tail, uh, the angle between them has to be less than ninety degrees because the dot product is positive. Okay. Okay, here are a few things to notice about the dot product. Um, first one is order doesn't matter. U dot V is equal to V dot U. Second, just sort of talking loosely about it, sort of intuitively. That uh, product tells you something about to what degree two vectors are in the same direction. To what degree two vectors are in the same direction? That's I stand by that sentence. <laughs> okay, I get it. <laughs> No, to what extent? <laughs> no puns in this class. And the third thing is that if U is perpendicular to V, then U dot V is zero. That makes sense if you think about number two because Two vectors that are perpendicular to each other aren't in the same direction in any way, and so the dot product has to be zero. It also makes sense if you think about the, the cosine relationship. Okay, so now uh, we're going to talk about work. Um, and work has a very specific physics meaning uh, that's different than our sort of loose, everyday language meaning of work. Um, work is a change in an object's energy due to the application of a force. OK, 
Okay, so uh, work has to be a change in energy. Something doesn't have work or not have work. It's a, it's a process. Um, positive work Positive work is when an object's energy increases. Uh, negative work means the object's energy decreases. And not all changes in energy are due to work. There's other ways to change an object's energy besides applying forces to it. Uh, the easiest example is you can change an object's energy by um, putting it in contact with something at a different temperature. Um, if, you, uh, if you put a pan on the stove, um, the temperature of the pan goes up because it's in contact with the fire from the stove. And as the temperature of the pan goes up, its energy goes up. Uh, yes. That's a perfect example, an egg too. And uh, um, that way of changing energy is called heat. Um, but in this class, we're only dealing with work. So that's only applications of force. Um, the SI units for work are newtons times meters. And if you do all the manipulations, yes, very good. This is joules, capital J, which is the same thing as, remember, with kinetic energy, um, we had units of kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the speed squared. So we get these funny units of kilograms, meters squared per second squared. But that's actually equal to joules, too. So this is the unit for any uh, type of energy. Um, work is defined. Uh, through a line integral. So here's the line integral definition of work. You like them? Have you guys all uh, talked about line integrals ever? No. Okay. Well, here's the definition, and I'll, I'll give you sort of the intuitive idea of what this means. We're not going to we're not going to do complicated line integrals, but um, so work is equal to the integral over the whole path of the object of the force vector dotted with the infinitesimal uh, line of motion dr. Um, and so here is kind of the idea. If an object's moving along a path like this, you can break down that path into a succession of infinitesimal motions, infinitesimal vectors. So that little motion is dr. The object at that location 
has a force applied to it like this. Then over that infinitesimal motion, infinitesimal uh, motion, you get an infinitesimal amount of work, dw, which is equal to f dotted with dr. So that's just using a, using a dot product. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the object is following this path, okay, and it's a continuous path. It doesn't it doesn't have any uh, straight line parts, but. Um, as you shrink down smaller and smaller, you can start approximating this by uh, by small straight line parts. You know, you can imagine doing like uh, an approximation where this was estimated by one millimeter motions, and each one of those is a straight line, and and it would track that motion. No, we're not doing anything like that. We're just we're just coming up with all these infinitesimal, these tiny little one millimeter uh, vectors dr, and figuring out the force that's applied to that object as it makes that one millimeter motion. And then we're just taking the dot product of those two vectors. But it's going to be, if dr is one millimeter, then dw, even if that force is huge, this is also going to be small. Adam Allah. Yep. Yes. The, is that what the work is measuring? Well, what we're doing is we're we're using what we know about the force at every location and about the path to figure out how much energy the total force is adding as the object goes from here to here. DR is direction and force is force is the force vector that's applied. So, you know, if this, if instead of being infinitesimal, this vector dr was the vector 8, negative 6 or something, and this force was 100, 400, you could take that dot product just like we just did in that example. And now instead of this being whatever I said, 8, negative 6, instead it's 0. 0.000008, negative 0. 0.00006, you know. It's infinitesimal, so even smaller than what I said. But you don't have to really think of it as infinitesimal. You can just think of it as small, you know. Um. Another way to think of this If F S, F sub S, is the component of the force, uh, that's parallel to the path, at each location, then you can think of this work calculation as being equal to the integral over the whole path of fs ds. OK. So if instead of knowing what this force is as a vector, we know at every instant how much of this force f is in the same direction as dr, then we can do it not as a line integral, but just as a 
regular integral. Uh, one thing to notice about these definitions, and this might be a little bit surprising, is um, no matter how big the force is, um, it doesn't do any work if the object doesn't move. And it uh, that can sort of make sense if you think about the, so work is a change in energy. And positive work means energy is increasing. Negative work means energy is decreasing. If you think of energy as being kinetic energy, remember kinetic energy of an object, if the object's mass stays the same, the kinetic energy just rises and falls with how fast it's going. If the object just stays at rest, how much kinetic energy, you know, so like, I'm super strong, so I'm putting tons of force into this right now. But like, uh, how much am I increasing its kinetic energy? Zero. Its velocity is the same no matter what, you know? Yes. Yes. Positive work means an increase, yes. And negative always means a decrease. Okay, so dr is that little piece of the path. So the whole path is made up of a sum of little vectors dr. Okay, you can trace all these little vectors dr to follow that path. So here's the first dr, second dr, and it just follows that path around. So basically, this is telling you the direction. Not basically, this is in fact telling you the direction of that path uh, at that instant. And then what was the other integral that went to dx? The difference there is we did the work, instead of doing it as a dot product, we did the work of calculating the part of the force that's parallel to the path. He's not listening. <laughs> okay. Part of the force, Fs is the part of the force that's parallel to the path. So instead of doing a dot product, we've already figured out what part of the force is parallel. Fs has to be, yeah. And then Ds is just tracking along that path. Okay, so let's do an example, shall we? Let's say um, that we have a force vector that's equal to 100x, 100xy. Okay. So that force vector is a function of the location. And that force vector is applied to an object as the object follows this path. Um, so there's the coordinate system. And let's say the object goes from 0 to 2 in the x direction, and then goes from 0 to 2 in the y direction. OK, so there's the path.
Okay, well, I'm going to break this path up into two pieces. Um, the first piece is, you know, the first path is this. And the work over that first piece, I'll call that work one, is equal to the integral over path one of the part of the force that's parallel to that path times ds. Okay. What's the part of the force? So here's the force vector up above. Which part of that force vector is parallel to that horizontal path? Well, it would be the horizontal component of that force vector. Okay. So it's going to be the 100x. So 100x times ds from 0 to 2. And so that's 50x squared. Yes, yeah. Uh, dx, I guess. Since. The path is along the x axis. Zero to two. And so this is positive 200 joules. Well, we don't know the units, I guess. But it's an energy of positive 200 that matches whatever the units are. And then the second path does this. The work over that second path is the integral. Um, we're going from the point 2, 2, nope, 2, 0 to the point 2, 2. For this vertical path, what's the part of the force vector that's parallel to the path? 100xy, the vertical part of that vector, the y component. So we have 100xy dy. Um, And so integrate with respect to y, you get 50xy squared evaluated from the point 2, to the point 2, 2. And you get 400. So the total work is 200 plus 400, 600. Okay, so energy was added to the object over that whole path. Any questions about that? Um, something to notice, don't get these confused. Um, don't confuse impulse with work. 
the way you calculate them, according to their integral definitions, is similar. Um, but impulse is an integral of force with respect to time. And work is an integral of a component of a force with respect to its path, whatever it's being parameterized by. If you start out with a force and you integrate with respect to time, you're getting impulse. If you integrate with something related to position, you get something that has to do with energy. Okay. So, um, yes. You can see that because it's not a vector. It doesn't have a vector symbol. So you're just you're just figuring out how far it's going in the direction of the path. But all of this stuff is uh, pretty complicated. We're not. I don't think you have any problems related to that. What you are going to do is, um, so if you've missed all of that up until now, that's okay. Here's the part that you need. Um, this gets simple uh, in the case of a constant force vector. Doing the integral. Not yet. But if um, the force F is constant as the object uh, goes through the displacement, makes the displacement, D vector. Then the work done is just equal to the force vector dotted with the displacement vector. This is the first one that's going to really be useful. OK, question? OK, so um, let me do an example, and then we'll take a 10-minute break. Yes. I just get so excited. Um, okay, so here's an example of using this. So let's say that a force vector of 50, 80 is applied to an object as it travels from point uh, negative 10, negative 6 to 2015. What's the work done by that force vector? Yeah, so that's one interesting thing to notice is I didn't say anything about the path that it took. It doesn't matter in this case. 
but the work is equal to the force dotted with the displacement. Why is the work equal to the force dotted with the displacement in this? Why don't we have to use the integral? Because it's a constant force. So that's the key thing. If you ever have a work calculation with a constant force, you're happy. You don't have to do the integral. Um, the force vector is 5080. The displacement vector is 2015 minus negative 10, negative 6, which is 3021. And so the work is 5080 dotted with 3021, which is 50 times 30 plus 80 times 21. Yes, I would like the answer. Do you have it? It's displacement. So displacement, you take the later position vector minus the earlier position vector. Thirty-one hundred, and if the units for force were newtons and the units for displacement were meters, this would be in joules. I know I just hadn't finished that eight yet. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's take a ten-minute break, seven-minute break. Come back at nine, and when we come back, Joseph is going to be high energy. Yes. Time to learn. Okay, so um, here's where we are. We just, we went from the definition of work to coming up with a simple version of work that works as long as, that works as long as the force is constant. And now we're going to, we did one example, but it was kind of like a mathematical example. Now we're going to do our first one that sort of connects it to the physical world. Okay, so let's do this example where we have this ample gentleman on an elevator. The ample gentleman. That would be a good band. Um, and let's say that <laughs> he's going up to the laundry room. Uh, and the passenger's mass is 100 kilograms. Nope. Um, yes. I don't remember. I don't think so. That's a different guy. Um, yeah. He just saw Ladybird. Um, and the elevator is going up with a constant speed. Okay, so if the elevator rises 10 meters, and now here are the questions. Um, first, what's the work done on the passenger by gravity?
uh, we don't even have to do that. We're just not considering it, you know. Um, we would need the mass of the elevator if we were calculating the work done on it. Um, so what's the work done uh, on the passenger? By gravity. Uh, second, what's the work done on the passenger by the floor of the elevator? Those are the only two forces acting on this guy. Yep, question. It's not a it's not a function of time. Uh, it's a function of of uh, the displacement, you know, the path. Um, and then last, what's the total force? Oh, sorry, what's the total work? Done on the passenger. Okay, so uh, the only forces acting are the weight, the force from gravity, and the force from the floor of the elevator. So we're just going to calculate those independently and add them up. And if you think of work as a change in energy, you can think of it as a change in kinetic energy. What do we expect the total work to be? What's the, what's the change in kinetic energy of that passenger as the elevator rises 10 meters at a constant velocity? The change in kinetic energy is going to be zero because the mass doesn't change and the speed doesn't change. OK? Who's with me on that? Yes. <laughs> so if the speed doesn't change, the kinetic energy doesn't change, we expect the total work to be 0. OK? So let's do the calculation and see that that happens. OK, so first, for, for A, uh, what's the force vector applied to the passenger by gravity? Yep, so negative 98.1, nope, 981. What? He has 100, 100 kilograms. For that guy to weigh 10, have a mass of 10 kilograms, he'd have to be like six inches tall. That's just the force. Yep. And now with the displacement, if he rises 10 meters, that's a positive 10 meters in the y direction, so that's zero positive 10. This is newtons, this is meters. And so the work done by gravity is 0 times 0 plus negative 981 times positive 10. And so that's negative 98 10 joules. Okay, so why is, why is gravity taking energy away from this guy as he rises 10 meters? Yeah, that's right. Like, if you think of the force of gravity is going against the velocity vector, then what gravity is trying to do is slow him down. If, if this force, if this guy rose 10 meters while this downward force of gravity was in and there were no other forces acting, then gravity would have the effect of slowing him down. Like you could think of, if he was in free fall being launched up into the air, 
and the, that, the only force was that downward force of gravity, he would start out fast and slow down over those 10 meters. Okay, so gravity is taking energy away. Okay, now um, for part B, we're trying to calculate the work that's done by the floor of the elevator. We have to know the force that the floor of the elevator applies. What's that going to be? Well, there's no acceleration. Yeah. That's right. And what you would get is the force on the elevator, the normal force, would just be zero positive 981 because the force of gravity and the normal force have to be equal and opposite if there's no acceleration. You know, we would get this from Newton's second law. If you don't see that right away, then uh, when, uh, when you're... Uh, English teacher is just blabbing on and on. Do do this on your paper so you have something to do to shut that nonsense up. Okay. What? Oh, I don't. Oh, okay. No one told me that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, so do it do it during lunch. Uh, is it okay? Can I talk bad about lunch and have them do it during lunch? Okay. <laughs> so do it during lunch. English is important. Or homeroom. Okay. Yes, Jeannie. Because we would do this. We would draw a free body diagram of this guy. And... Um, there would be a downward force of gravity of 981, an upward normal force. And then Newton's second law would say 0, negative 981 plus 0n is equal to zeros because there's no acceleration. And so n is equal to 981. See that? So um, the work done by the elevator is 0, 981 added with 0, 10. And that's equal to 0 times 0 plus 981 times 10. And you get 98, 10 joules. That's positive. So energy is being added. Okay, does it make sense that the floor of the elevator, the upward force of the floor of the elevator, is trying to increase, is increasing the person's energy? Does that make intuitive sense to you? Yeah, and if you think, like, if, ele if gravity was removed, and the only force applied was this 981 Newton force pushing on the person's feet, the person would speed up as he rose 10 meters. Okay? And so now for part C, what's the total energy, at the total work? It's negative 9810 from the eight. Plus 9810 from the floor of the elevator, so zero joules. And that makes sense because the speed is constant. Okay, here's a brain teaser for you. Ready? Explain this to me. So 
if the intuition of that makes sense, now think about a case where the person, as the elevator rises 10 meters, speeds up. So the elevator is speeding up over those 10 meters. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So the so now the total work, the kinetic energy is increasing. Okay. So now the total work has to be positive. So how does it, <coughs> thinking about it this way, how does it make sense that the total work would be positive? Yeah. Right. That's right. So because there's acceleration, positive acceleration, the floor of the elevator would need to be pushing harder. The gravity is still going to be removing, removing energy. Gravity is always, any force that's acting in the opposite direction of the displacement is taking away energy. If it was the only thing acting, the thing would be slowing down. So gravity is, gravity is still slowing the person down, uh, removing energy. But now the normal force to, to make the person accelerate has a bigger magnitude of force going up than gravity does down. And so, and so the floor of the ele elevator is going to be adding more energy to the passenger than gravity is going to be removing, and you get a positive. Yes? Well, let's, let's do that calculation. Okay. Now let's say uh, the acceleration is zero two meters per second squared. Okay. So the force applied by gravity is still zero negative nine eighty one. Free body diagram of the passenger has the weight acting down, the normal force up, and so Newton's second law says zero negative nine eighty one plus zero n is equal to one hundred times zero two. And so the normal force is equal to 1181. That normal force has to be bigger now because of that acceleration. Uh, and so the force applied by the elevator is zero positive 1181 newtons. Okay, so now the work done by gravity, that's not going to change from the last example. That's still going to be 0, negative 981 dotted with 0, 10. And you get negative 9810 joules. Who's with me? Nobody? That's terrible. Who is not with me? This is the same, right? Anybody who is not with me, that's terrible. Be better people. <laughs> okay, and the work done by the elevator, this is the one that changes. Okay. Is the force of zero eleven eighty one? Yeah, the uh, dot, dotted with zero ten. So that's zero times zero 
plus 1181 times 10, and that is 11,810 joules. And so the total work is negative 9810 plus 11.810, and that is equal to 2,000 joules. It's positive, so energy is increased. And if energy is increased, the kinetic energy goes up, the speed goes up. So this, in, this increase in energy, or this positive value of work, tells us that the elevator is speeding up. Yeah. So it, it would be the opposite, yep. If it was slowing down, you'd have a smaller normal force than, than the weight force and you'd get a net negative work. Um, now, um, there are some forces that always do zero work, and we're going to take advantage of that in almost every problem we do, maybe every problem we do. Well, not this one. Um, so here's an important fact about work. Because work is defined with this dot product idea, um, any force that's always perpendicular to the path Does no work. Yeah. Any force that's always perpendicular to the path does zero work. And this um, this really is the main reason that energy methods can sometimes be easier to use to get the same result as Newton's methods, as force methods. Um, so here are the important cases. Um, the first one, the most important example, is any normal force in rolling or sliding problems. So if you have a, let's say a cart rolling down this incline, The velocity is, you know, it could be either way, but it has to be parallel to that surface. The normal force is perpendicular to that velocity. And so that normal force isn't doing any work, even though it's applying a force. And that's even true, this is kind of the amazing thing, if you don't have a flat surface. Um, because if this part's rolling along this surface, the velocity at this instant is tangent to the surface. The normal force is normal to, perpendicular to the surface. And so those normal forces do no work.
Now, you can't always assume that any normal force does zero work. We just saw that in the elevator example. But if you have a, if you just have a surface, you know, fixed to the ground, uh, and, and an object is rolling or sliding along that surface, then that normal force does no work. And that means that you don't even have to know what the normal force is to know that it does no work. Yes, but, right, that's true, but uh, mental work is not work in physics, because, yeah, that's true, that's chemical energy, yes. They don't change the energy of that thing. Well, gravity still does, and any other force still does. It's just that normal force doesn't. And the other one, I'm going to say this, and then I'm done. Uh, yeah, usually. Over there. You see it? Um, any centripetal forces... In circular motion and tripetal. That's not funny. I've heard funny stuff before, and that wasn't it. Centripetal forces in circular motion. Um, so, for example, let's think about think about a setup where you have a string connected to a ball that's moving along a circular path. The velocity is perpendicular to the path at every instant. That centripetal force is towards the center. That's perpendicular to the velocity. And so that tension in that case does no work. Uh, that is right, and it makes sense if you think about the fact that, you know, no work means no change in energy, and uniform circular motion means the speed is constant. So you're exactly right. Yep. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, that's all. Have a nice weekend. Oh, listen to Meredith.